since they know their business, they must know more about their business than we do, and no doubt they do, but they still make tremendous mistakes. First of all, there really is no standard nest size. They got to find what they can, and not only do they have to find what they can, they have to compete with birds, and squirrels, and wasps, and other animals that are also looking for a nest cavity to dwell. So as we have cut down and cleaned up our forests, particularly across the Midwest, taken out the old trees that had cavities in them, we've taken down these nesting trees that these bees would have nested in. So these nesting cavities are hard to come by. My first point, this is a bee tree that is blown over or broken off. What does anybody think is going to happen to a rotted tree that's hollow inside? Do you think any animal that's moving into that nest has any sense of perpetuity? No. This is going to be the fairly quick fate of all bees nesting in hollow trees. So my first point I'd like you to think about for a while is that these bees are not really setting up housekeeping thinking that they're going to be going here indefinitely. We want the bees to go indefinitely. What this colony wanted to do was to set up in about a one cubic foot area, cast as many swarms as it could, and make enough honey to win her over. And if it didn't do that, then still it would have some successful swarms out here, maybe. But see, from a human standpoint, that is just not acceptable. I mean, I'm gonna go home and lose this belly I'm going to exercise, I'm going to eat right, and I'm going to really affect my future fate. I can't tell, I have no business guessing, that bees have such a commitment to anything other than the immediate future and what they should be doing right now. So first of all, we're the ones who want these bees to live in these white boxes year after year after year after year. In their world, this quickly becomes what happens to them because where they're having to set up housekeeping. If they can't find a place to live, and you had to be there in this maple, when they did this, they send out all these scouts, they search for one cubic foot, defendable entrance, dry, nothing else living there, and not on the ground. Not being able to find that, and time moving on, sometimes they're forced to do this. And the only thing that separates that from this is that box. We keep them out of the rain, and we knock some of the wind off, and I guess we make it more difficult for the squirrels and the birds to get to them, but actually that box is not a particularly amazing barrier to anything outside, but it fits our need, it works okay. The second thing, I don't know what this means, does it mean anything at all? The midrib in a natural comb is about the thickness of that sheet of paper. And then what we do is we contact any bee supply company we can get and we put in foundation inserts that you can physically flex that are nine to 10 times thicker than that. I have no idea what that means for wintering bees trying to get in head first, generate heat, share heat, conduct heat, when we've got this thick barrier that we put inside there now. But that thick barrier really makes a stout comb that will withstand the rigors of extracting remarkably well. This is in Arizona, and I want you to respect brothels. This is not just something you sit in church and scrape off your hands while you got nothing else to do there. You should be listening anyway. This stuff sticks to everything. It's on the floor, it's on your hands, it's all over. And look at this barrier that these bees have laid down to kind of dispel ants and other invaders from moving in and bothering that nest. But the important thing is, look how empty that nest is. Bees don't see this nest as a commitment to forever. Bees see that nest as a temporal site. As long as food's there, as long as they can survive, they'll stay right there. When it's not there, Africanized bees especially will give it up, abandon it, and move on. 